Tenakoto Tefano o Aotearoa Unitarians. Tenakoto na manahiri, no mai, haramai, haramai ki tene fare karakia, a te atua, tenakoto, tenatato katoa. Welcome to all near and far to our virtual sanctuary. Our virtual sanctuary is not far enough away to not to help me avoid what's going on in Glasgow. This week, I have been following the 26th Conference of the Parties, or COP26, uh, in Glasgow. I have found it mostly a discouraging task with glimmers of hope far and few between. It has been 30 years since these meetings began. Little positive change has occurred. The Paris Agreement in 2015, COP21, was the momentous one. For the first time ever, every country agreed to work together to limit global warming to well below two degrees and aim for 1.5 degrees to adapt to the impacts of a changing climate and to make money available to deliver on these aims. The problem is they fail to follow through. We are approaching the brink where we will be able to do little to accomplish the goal. So it occurs to me that it's time to speak truth to power. To inspire us, I offer a poem called A Poem in a Time of Peril by Barbara Road. Of course, truth is hard. It is a rock. Yet I do not think it will fall upon me and crush me. I do not think they can hammer it into bits and stone me. Help me place the rock in the strong current of these rushing waters. I must climb upon it. I must know how truth feels when I plunge naked into the bright depths of these waters. I must know how truth feels when I'm swept by the cold fury of these waters. I must know with my whole being how truth feels. I shall remember how truth feels. I praise the rock, I praise the river, I fear the drought more than death by water. And for our chalice lighting, if you have a candle or chalice, this is the time. We light this chalice for the web of life which sustains us for the sacred circle of life in which we have our being, for the earth, the sky above and below, for our mother earth and for the mystery. For our music this week, I have decided to uh, move beyond our hymnal for some things that are uh, related to our topic. This is Mother Earth by Neil Young. For our next song, um, it focuses very much on my musings today and the terms and the idea of speaking truth to power. In fact, that's the title of it, and it's by a group called One Republic. My musings this week draw on a quote from Greta Thunberg, blah, blah, blah. To introduce my musings this morning, I'm turning to an 18-year-old woman who, ever since she was a child, has been teaching us how to speak truth to power. 
Greta Thunberg has resisted being a token voice used by governments lacking political will and glo by global companies seeking to monetize efforts to stop killing the planet while doing their best to protect their financial interests in extracting carbon. This is a short speech she gave on the eve of COP26. And she says it so eloquently, I think you need to hear the whole thing. It's seven minutes. While not devoid of hope, Greta paints a pretty bleak picture and she is right. While 193 parties signed the Paris Accord, that was the easy part. Signing that offered positive headlines without having to put much skin in the game. It was, a, it was good PR for governments not challenging their countries to take on the sacrificial requirements to make the headlines a reality was good politics. Besides, the climate change deniers were muddying the waters to stall acknowledging the science and the fierce urgency of now. So again, she's right. There is a lot of blah, blah, blah to drown out our inaction. Before going further, I need to clarify the differences between a person and a people. There are countless persons of reason and integrity and passion who get the science and are doing all they are capable of to mitigate the destruction of the planet. Greta is just one of many examples. There are even some politicians and corporations genuinely trying to make a difference. Then there are people. All too often, they are irrational, superstitious, selfish, fearful, and easily manipulated into a mob mentality by persons at the other end of the continuum from the Gretas. Those people act without conscience. Concern and care for the common good do not trump their desire for power and profit. They don't even feel responsible for those they manipulate to achieve their purposes. When good persons who do care are afraid or intimidated, they tend to look at what has to be done as being in the too hard basket, leaving a vacuum for those of ill will. Here are some examples. The three big emitters of carbon into the atmosphere are China, the US, and India. Cooperation between such disparate political systems and cultures would be hard enough without adding the hardening of relations between the US and China over Taiwan and Hong Kong, trade, domination of the South China Sea, and human rights violations. Xi Jinping has chosen not to attend COP26. But China has agreed to stop building coal-fed generators outside of China, while more than doubling the number being built inside China. Blah, blah, blah. The wishful thinking is that China will reach peak emissions by 2030 and will reach zero emissions by 2060, which will be much too late. The U.S. has never once passed through Congress a green bill. Joe Biden 
is a vast improvement over his predecessor, who withdrew the U.S. from the Paris Accord. Biden was has returned to the Paris Accord. He has joined with the European Union in an effort to reduce methane emissions and has provided billions for assisting developing countries become greener and to survive the effects of climate change that will hit them hardest. Unfortunately, the bank Morgan Stanley and others are saying billions will not be nearly enough. We are now in the territory of trillions. And then for reasons beyond my comprehension, last week, Biden approved opening vast portions of government land for gas and oil exploration. Blah, blah, blah. India's Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, is thought to be at least be open to net zero emissions in a country that has been heavily coal dependent as renewable energy becomes more cost effective. However, India has long said all substantial emissions cutting efforts must come from developed countries, which bear historical responsibility even though recent figures show its cumulative emissions since 1850 outstrip those of the UK. Blah, blah, blah. There are, of course, others to be mentioned. We all know what Brazil's president, Jair Bolsonaro, has done to Amazon's rainforest. It has been carnage. He and those he represent have brought the world's biggest rainforest, a huge carbon sink, to the brink of becoming a source of carbon. Shortly before COP26, he promised to double the budget for protecting the Amazon. Not sure how much double very little is, but nevertheless, he reneged on that commitment days later. In addition, he wrecked the last COP in 2019 over the technicalities of carbon trading, an issue still to be resolved at this COP. More blah, blah, blah. And then there is the prime minister across the ditch. Here is what the Australian Climate Council had to say about Scott Morrison's visit to Glasgow. Prime Minister Scott Morrison has addressed world leaders at COP26 in Glasgow with a speech that was light on commitments and credibility, but heavy on spin. Morrison claimed that his government is acting on climate change in, quote, the Australian way, unquote. However, based on the federal government's track record, their way of responding to the climate threat is very un-American and includes, one, blocking global collaboration on climate action, b, promoting the extension and expansion of fossil fuels like coal, oil, and gas, and refusing to step up and set ambitious climate goals. Even with a net zero, a new net zero by 2050 target, Australia remains dead last on climate. Our actions so far at COP26 have only cemented our global reputation as a climate action blocker. Our PM stood up in front of the world and effectively promised to do nothing. If speaking spots at COP26 were determined by the strength and merit of each country's commitments, then the PM would not have been given the mic. That's right, blah, blah, blah. Now, before we catapult too many stones across the ditch into other people's glass houses, New Zealand is far from doing its fair share yet. 
Well, I believe there are many persons in our government who understand that we are in a climate emergency. I don't see them preparing the people for what sacrifice is going to be required. My major criticism is that there is a reluctance to spend the political capital to do what most in leadership know needs doing. Pain will be required if hope is to be found. Let me offer a couple of examples. At the, as the Glasgow Climate Summit is underway, New Zealand's government has announced a revised pledge with a headline figure of a 50% reduction on gross 2005 emissions by the end of the decade. That is really so much blah, blah, blah. New Zealand's actual emissions in the 2010s were 701 million tons of carbon dioxide. The carbon budget for the 2020s is only 675 million tons. The old pledge for the 2020s was a little more reasonable, 623 million tons. The Climate Change Commission's advice was for much less than 593 million tons. And the new nationally determined contribution is 571 million tons. Okay, so yes, the new pledge meets the commission's advice and it's a step up on the old. However, due to the application of two different complicated accounting methods, it does not meet our fair share under the Paris Agreement. Instead of a 50% reduction of emission, the real NDC nationally determined contribution figure is only 21.8%. The climate does not care about our clever accounting choices. It cares about the level of net emissions. And our failure to walk the talk will be apparent to our trading partners in our United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Reporting. New Zealand's old climate strategy was based on tree planting and the purchase of offshore carbon credits. The tree planting came to an end in the early 2010s and is only now resuming. While the emissions trading scheme was closed to international markets in 2015, the Paris Agreement was intended to allow a restart of international carbon trading, but this has not yet been possible. New Zealand has a terrible record in cutting emissions so far. Burning of fossil fuels actually increased by 9% from 2016 to 2019. It's a challenge to turn around our high emissions economy. With only two months to go until 2022, the official start of the carbon budgets, there is no plan to meet them. The suggestions in the consultation document add up to only half the cuts needed for the first budget period. Thinking in the transport area is the furthest advanced with a solid approach to fuel efficiency already approved and an acknowledgement total driving must decrease. Active and public transport must increase and new roads may not be compatible with climate targets. But industry needs to step up massively. The proposed 2037 end date for coal burning is far too late. While the milk cooperative Fonterra intends to begin phasing out natural gas for milk drying only after that date. And don't get me started on the reduction of methane. Agriculture produces 48% of our greenhouse emissions. 
of which 71% is methane from primarily cows. How we will reduce that by 47% by 2050 is a mystery unless political will and sacrifice is brought to bear. It is enough to make you wonder how many millions of tons of greenhouse emissions is produced by blah, blah, blah. It's time to extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, a mere wisp of matter in process, almost as insubstantial as the thought of it. Yet our civilization has harnessed the power of such a flame to drive and shape a new world. So may it be with the power of our thoughts that in truth and love they may drive and shape a new world. I thought after all that, we needed something maybe a little more positive. This is a, a new song that was written for COP26. Normally, I give you some kind of short blessing or thought I had planned to do the same today, but in my searching for material to uh, educate myself as well as you, uh, I came across another of Greta's talks. She's a child. She's being, they're trying to co-opt her in the entertainment industry by giving her a huge award. And I listened to this, and I'm not, I'm not the emotional one in my family. I'm not the one where the tears start streaming. But I've, I had to plug them up a little bit on this one. So I thought I would share this with you. You may not have the same reaction, but I think it's worthy for our closing. I find it astounding to see someone of that age with that much poise able to speak so articulately truth to power or even truth to entertainers. So. Well, now I'm going to invite you to speak truth to one another. And uh, the conversation starter I'm going to offer you how much are you willing to sacrifice for environmental justice? And what would you balk at? Um, you know, we're talking like taxes and means of transportation and travel and how we eat and how we entertain ourselves. And, uh, the list goes on and on. 